All right. So we spent some time talking about neurotransmitters and the types of receptors that neurotransmitters use. And I know I stressed uh, great caution in regard to making any associations uh, between a neurotransmitter and a particular type of behavior. That being said, there are some overall systems, multiple brain regions that uh, together create a system, what's known as an activating system, and they tend to use a single neurotransmitter. So these activating systems involve neural pathways that coordinate brain activity through the single neurotransmitter. And again, while this collection of brain regions may be using a single neurotransmitter, the overall effect of those neurotransmitters is not any one behavior. Moreover, that really reflects uh, complex behaviors, very complex behaviors that are uh, mediated by this one neurotransmitter. The cell bodies of these activated systems tend to be located in a nucleus in the brainstem and their axons are distributed through a wide region of the brain. So this does not involve any one region and instead reflects more global connectivity within the brain. And there are four systems that correspond to four neurotransmitters. One is the cholinergic system, another is the dopaminergic system, uh, the third is the noradrenergic system, and the serotonergic system. So now I'm going to talk about each of these systems in turn, beginning with the cholinergic system. So the cholinergic system mediates normal waking behavior and is thought to function in attention and memory. And the loss of cholinergic neurons is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So the cholinergic neuron system, excuse me, the cholinergic system is going to involve acetylcholine as its primary neurotransmitter. And you can see here where it has a uh, nucleus, nuclei in the brainstem and how this is distributed all throughout the brain. So we have nuclei in the brainstem and in the basal forebrain nuclei and that these send a wide array of projections out into the frontal, cor uh, frontal cortex all the way back into the parietal cortex. And this distribution, even this pathway here, is highly important because most of these connections begin uh, here and uh, again you have sort of waking um, and attentive behavior and they pass through the frontal cortex which again is highly involved in goal-directed behavior back to the parietal lobes which are involved in attention and um, spatial reasoning so you're going to have your frontal lobes that are going to then ha exert top-down influence that they're going to try to exert some goal-directed influence on attention so in this overall capacity, the cholinergic system is active in maintaining uh, waking electroencephalography patterns uh, in the cortex. So these are patterns of neural activity that are present when an individual is awake as opposed to when they are asleep. It's also thought to play a role in memory by maintaining neuron excitability. And the death of cholinergic neurons and a decrease in acetylcholine in the neocortex is again thought to be related to Alzheimer's disease. To give you a little bit of an example here, um, the frontal lobes are highly responsible for maintaining uh, activity. So if you're going to be thinking about uh, trying to maintain a phone number, or even if you're going to access a memory, so both of those are going to begin in the frontal lobes where you will be actively rehearsing information or you're going to implement a retrieval strategy. This is in particular a memory retrieval strategy that would then try to uh, reactivate the pattern of neuroactivity that is associated with a particular memory or feature. And so you can see how in individuals with Alzheimer's disease that if they have a loss of these cholinergic neurons uh, and that they would then be unable to maintain information over the short term and they would also be unable to engage in some of the pattern completion in terms of uh, a basic pattern completion by that I mean sort of a reconstructing of a memory that would be uh, controlled by the frontal cortex. 
And the next we have the dopaminergic system. And this involves two paths, the nigrostriatal path. This is involved in coordinating movement and this degenerates in Parkinson's disease. And we also have the mesolimbic path and this enhances responses to environmental stimuli. And this is implicated in addiction and schizophrenia. So here we talk a fair amount about dopamine in this course because it is involved, uh, the primary reason that students are interested in is because it's involved in drugs. But uh, it's also, people are familiar with it through Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. And so here you can see that we have this dopaminergic system, but it has these two parts. And these two parts would then help to resolve confusion about how you can have the same neurotransmitter that is involved in this really wide array of behaviors from drug addiction to Parkinson's disease. So here we have the, um, these two pathways. So here you have the substantia nigra in orange, and this is the nigrostriatal pathway. And this is active in maintaining normal motor behavior and a loss of D and a loss of dopaminergic neurons is related to muscle rigidity and dyskinesia and Parkinson's disease. So here you have this particular nigrostriatal path. Again, you have a nucleus here in the substantia Niagara and this passes out into the caudate to help uh, regulate these behaviors. So a loss of neurons here is going to have in particular effects on movement and control. Then you have the role of dopamine in this mesolimbic path, okay? And so here, this begins in the ventral tegmentum and this nucleus here, and it's actually going to extend down the spinal cord and into the cerebellum. And then it extends here all the way up into the frontal lobes. And this is particularly important. So here is the nucleus accumbens, the basal ganglia. These are highly involved in movement. And so this nigrostriatal path is going to impact information here. And then you also have the dopamine that also extends into this area uh, because the nucleus accumbens is also highly involved in reward activity. So you have, people wouldn't typically think of like, oh, you have this movement element and then you have this reward. Well, if you think back to very, very early origins, then what's going to motivate an animal to move? Well, a particular reward of some kind, you know, so they're going to have some reward seeking behavior. And in principle, the vast majority of movement that we engage in is reward seeking in some sort of way. What we have now is what we have these two paths that control different aspects of this reward seeking behavior. And we have one that's involved in, in coordinating complex movement. And then we have another that is really developed in terms of reward responsivity. And this is, of course, implicated in addiction. This is also implicated in uh, schizophrenia and how individuals can have uh, highly disorganized thought. So in the mesolimbic pathway, and again, this is in purple, dopamine release causes feelings of reward and pleasure. And so this is thought to be the neurotransmitter most affected by addictive drugs. And this relationship between uh, reward-seeking behavior and even elements of movement should really illustrate that when drugs tap into this reward pathway that is typically called the dopaminergic system more broadly, then it can really be hijacking some of the core elements that uh, any sort of seeking behavior that we engage in. So this can affect attention, movement. Think about the types of behaviors that we typically engage in. We're going to be eating. We're going to be, uh, of course, eating and drinking for reward-related activities is necessary for survival. We also have reward-oriented activity. The schoolwork that you do, these are all things that are geared towards a particular reward. Work-related activity, this is geared towards a particular reward that you're seeking at some point in the future. So if drugs hijack that system, if they become the focus of the reward, then those drugs can replace uh, the typical things that an individual would seek, such as confirmation and acceptance from friends, affirmation at work, even elements of food, and 
you can be then seeking the drugs over these other important aspects of life. So it is in this way that drug addiction can really hijack and they don't and uh, the term hijack is is a really great term that it really sort of takes over aspects of this dopaminergic system. And uh, I'll be talking about um, drug addiction um, towards the end of this class, but I'll also be talking about it a little bit later on in the chapter and in, and in subsequent chapters when we talk about more about learning and reward. Third, we have the noradrenergic system. This plays a role in learning by stimulating neurons that change their structure. This may also facilitate normal development of the brain and organized movements. And so imbalances in this system can also be associated with depression and uh, mania. And so depression or also mania is commonly known as bipolar disorder. So this system involves the neurotransmitter neuroepinephrine. And neuroepinephrine is active in maintaining emotional tone. So a common thing that can occur in depression, for example, is that individuals can become... Uh, affectively flat, that uh, you can't really tell, sort of more um, expressionless, um, they just don't react to information as much. Even sad things, you know, may not as mentally move them. They can become uh, apathetic. And happy things definitely don't have the same effect on them. Uh, decreases in neuroepinephrine activity are also thought to be related in this way to depression. And that increases are then thought to be related to mania or overexcited behavior. So it's possible that an imbalance in norepinephrine too high uh, can lead to mania or too low can lead to depression. And this is something that they're investigating in greater depth. But you can see ha here how you have this um, the locus or locus corellius in the brainstem and this extends has very very specific extensions up into the thalamus which is really important for regulating emotion and the thalamus is a major relay station for all incoming information from the environment and we'll be talking about that more but the vast majority of input stimulation that you get from the environment it passes through the thalamus so if you're going to have an imbalance in neuroepinephrine, then this imbalance can impact how all this incoming information is coded and reacted to. And this could be in particular why this imbalance can lead to these gross changes in affective state. So the connections, of course, extend from uh, the limbic region all the way into the the frontal cortex here in particular traveling there's uh, connections in the orbital frontal cortex which is uh, also linked with uh, emotional behavior all the way here into uh, higher order executive and control aspects of movement in the somatosensory and uh, movement areas and then here even into attention in the parietal lobes and finally you have the serotonergic system and the serotonergic system plays a role in wakefulness and learning. And interestingly, imbalances are also associated with depression, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and sleep apnea. So serotonin is also active in maintaining this waking electroencephalography state. Patterns in serotonin activity are related to obsessive compulsive disorder, tics, and schizophrenia and decreases in serotonin activity are related to depression. It's thought that you ha can have these abnormalities in brainstem. Uh, 5-HT, it's referring to serotonin, a particular type of serotonin. So you can have abnormalities in brainstem serotonin neurons that are linked to disorders such as sleep apnea and SIDs is uh, sudden infant death syndrome. So we'll be talking more about serotonin when we get into sleep. So some aspects of the relationship with sleep we'll talk about later. But you can see here how diffuse serotonin is throughout the brain. These mul multiple RAFE nuclei that are involved in serotonin release. And it travels throughout the limbic region into the frontal lobes, multiple pathways. 
And so the challenge, of course, with serotonin and any of these systems for matter is that these systems, they're associated with a particular neurotransmitter and they tend to be associated with overarching patterns of behavior as we were talking about them here. But even these overarching patterns have really great variability because you have, for example, these four systems and you see some overlap in how, well, I could see how multiple of these systems could contribute to depression, for example. And so it may be that you do have these sort of additive effects in terms of vulnerabilities across these various systems that can give rise to coping issues, psychopathology, um, adaptively coping, uh, even uh, mitigating risk, aspects of intelligence, leadership. I mean, all of these are going to influence by these active systems in the brain and the, the interplay of these neurotransmitters across these systems.